G'day, I'm Paul. I'm seeing a stack of these cars around. It's the Toyota Yaris Cross. We reviewed this car a little while back and I've got to be honest, I didn't really love it. It was way too expensive at the top end and didn't feel like it was good value for money. Well, this time around, we've gone to the lower end of the price bracket. This one is just one up from the entry level. This is the GXL. It's the hybrid two-wheel drive version. This here is priced at just over $30,000, but if that is too expensive, the entire range kicks off from a little over 25 grand. So there's something in there for everyone, and then it goes all the way up to that super expensive one that we drove a little while back. What are you gonna buy if you don't wanna buy one of these? Well, you've got Mazda CX-3, Hyundai Venn, you Kia Seltos, they're just some of the competitors in this segment. Today we're going to do a detailed review of this car, so if you do want to skip ahead to other parts of the review, you can use the time codes up on the screen there, or if you're on YouTube, scroll down and use the chapters below. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon, because that's going to tell you every single time we drive very blue cars. Let's talk exterior. So you've got eight external colours to pick from. All but black is a little under $600 extra. Now, the design. So this is based on the Yaris. It shares a platform with the Yaris. So it is 30 mil higher off the ground than a standard Yaris. It's 90 mil taller, 20 mil wider, and 240 millimetres longer. So despite sharing a platform with the Yaris, it is very much a bigger vehicle than the Yaris. Down the front here, uh, if you've seen our other Toyota hybrid videos, you will know that the blue here signifies that this is a hybrid. So if you ever spot one in traffic and see the blue, you know that this is an environmentally conscious person. You've got a radar sensor just under the logo there, and then a camera here for uh, the wider view camera. And I'll run you through that when we go for a drive. It is interesting here, they've you know, the whole purpose of a grill is to keep a car cool. And given that this is a tiny little engine and obviously doesn't require much cooling, three quarters of that grill is completely closed up. So it's kind of the, just here for design purposes. It doesn't really sort of serve any real cooling purpose, which is an interesting dilemma, especially as EVs come along because they require less cooling up the top here. So um, yeah, watch this space. I think eventually in the design field, we will see this disappear from cars as we move towards battery electric vehicles. Over here, you've got a set of full LED headlights with an LED daytime running light. You've got an indicator down the bottom there. Whip around to the side. 16 inch alloy wheels. That is a very chubby profile tyre and I suspect that's going to mean this will ride very nicely. Typically cars that are on the TNGA platform like this one. I don't know, the ride is just really well sorted here for Australia and this is going to add to that. So can't you see what it's like when we go for a drive? And because it's an SUV, you've got to have wheel arch protectors. Look at the size of that. It's almost 630 sized in terms of its bulkiness just there. Another hybrid badge on the side there. You've got an indicator built into that wing mirror and then a camera beneath there. So you've got this black strip here that divides the body colors. Come back here, you've got privacy glass. Up the top there you've got a shark fin aerial. Little spoiler here with a brake light built in. And then more of that blue badging for your hybridness with more hybrid there. LED tail lights. Let me know what you think in the comments section below. Do you like the design and do you think that the price is justified given how much bigger this is than a standard Yaris hatchback? So we're inside the Yaris Cross. We will start with the key. So you've got lock, unlock, Toyota then nothing on the back. It's a proximity sensing key. So you grab the door handle, once you're inside, you've got that big start button just there. Okay, so in terms of design, I've got to say this is probably one of the blandest looking interiors I've seen in quite a long time. So you've got, you know, piano black all over the place, really small infotainment system, and just everything is this nasty plastic, and it's all just sort of quite dark as well. So um, yeah, it is a little bit disappointing that they haven't put just a tiny bit more effort into this because this is a vehicle that's potentially going to be bought by young people. And I think that a young person would want something a little more stylish than just um, you know what we see here in front of us. So a little bit disappointing there. So I said that most of the materials are scratchy. I, I do correct myself. This stuff up the top here is a tiny bit soft up to that point where it gets a little scratchy and then it sort of stays scratchy down the doors with these cloth segments sort of built in. So. Anyway, um, touch point. So you've got no center armrest. Um, you can kind of rest your arm on that, but that's like solid. And then this is uh, solid as well. So how solid is it? Well, we've got our gyrometer. We've tested the main surfaces in this cabin. If you want to see how this car compares to others that we've tested before, have a look at the link in the description. Build quality. It's got a bit of flex in it just there, but I think the rest of this feels okay in terms of how it's put together. Door. Sounds a little bit 
cheap and nasty. I wonder if it's just because that window was open a little bit. Yeah, sounds a little bit better, but yeah, a little tinny. Now, moving on to infotainment. So I mentioned before that it is like a very small screen and I just don't know why they don't go with the bigger screen given you've got all of that real estate. Instead, they've gone with what is possibly the smallest screen they can find. So uh, it is a seven inch screen. You've got shortcut buttons on either side and then its functionality is sort of fairly straightforward. You've got a menu there with shortcuts to uh, some of your options. In terms of audio, you have AM, FM, DAB plus digital radio, and that's all plumbed through a six speaker sound system. Sound system isn't very good, but what is good is a new feature that Toyota has added to some of its cars, which is a remote connection to the car. So it has an embedded SIM. It allows you to interact with the car remotely, but it also fits this feature here. So it's not an injector seat, but it is an SOS button. So if you do run into any dramas or have a car crash, uh, you can hit that and that will uh, send for assistance, which I think is a really great feature. And Toyota are one of the few to be doing it in this segment. So it's great to see that they're actually rolling that technology out. In terms of smartphone mirroring, you have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Both are wired. I'll show you what Apple CarPlay looks like first. So it takes up the entire sort of portion of that small screen. Uh, it's, it's not too bad. It's kind of fast, but can be a little bit laggy at times. I'll show you what Android Auto looks like. So same story, full screen integration, tiny bit laggy, but at least it has it. You've got a screen ahead of the driver here as well. This contains your trip computer, plus a few more details on the drive. We'll go into a bit more depth with this when we do go for a drive, but in terms of the functionality, you can just skip between some of these menus, see your safety details, and also what the hybrid system is doing. And now safety, you have front AEB, rear AEB, front and rear cross traffic alert. You have a lane departure warning and a lane keeping assistant. Radar cruise control, you have a blind spot monitor built into the wing mirror. And in terms of parking, you have front and rear parking sensors and a 360 camera. I'll show you what that looks like. Pop that into reverse. Um, quality of that is really, really poor. I mean, look at that. The 360 camera is kind of just pointless because you can't really see anything. And the visibility out the rear is just really basic as well. Although you can go to a bigger view if you need to. I just honestly don't know why they don't just fit these with a better camera. Cameras are so cheap at the moment. So anyway. Moving on to practicality, and we'll start with connectivity. So you have one USB-A port, and when you have smartphone mirroring running, that's in use. So you really can't do anything with any other devices in the car because that's in use. Uh, but you do get a 12 volt outlet. This is a lower grade car, so there's a stack of blank buttons all over the place here. In terms of storing your phone, where are you going to put it? Well, it can live down here in the cup holders, kind of, or you can pop it down the front there as well. And then in terms of your coffee cup, that can easily live down there. There's no teeth or anything like that, but it is easy to retrieve that. Same story with the bottle, that can easily slot into there. We'll try that one inside the door as well. That is an easy fit. Now, what about our big bottle? So, uh, look, it, it actually fits, but you've got to wedge it into there and force it in, and then it's really hard to get out. So. Um, yeah, it's good, but not amazing there in terms of bottle fit. Other storage, well, you've got this little hole just here. You've got this nook just beneath the screen, and you also have a glove box there that is kind of reasonably sized, but most of the space is robbed by the manual. Moving on to comfort, you have single zone automatic climate control, and that's about it. The seats, they are very cloth. Uh, design is kind of okay though, so you've got the sort of designed textile section on that side and then a graphic on that center section while this top is just pretty sort of basic. In terms of comfort, they're pretty comfortable to sit in. They're sort of inoffensive in that sense. Fully manually adjustable for both the driver and front passenger. And then on the steering front, you have both tilt and reach adjustment. On our reach test, uh, all of this is easy to reach, but for these controls, you will have to lean in to get to the left-hand side of that screen. Okay, now before I run through this, um, not a huge fan of this door. I mean, that is as far as it opens. So yeah, it's just really not very good in terms of the aperture there. So pretty disappointing. Uh, space, it's not a great deal of it. So my knees are wedged into that seat. Tow room's uh, not too bad. Headroom is reasonable. Um, look, I mean, yes, this is based on the Yaris. I understand that, but it is longer than a Yaris and bigger than a Yaris. And I think that if you're making an SUV, why would you not make there be enough room here, especially if you're going to be carrying friends and stuff like that in it. So pretty disappointing in terms of the amount of space back here. And that flows onto the amenities. You've got one map pocket there, no air vents, no USB charging, um, you know, even this stuff, like that's almost made entirely out of a single cast of plastic. It's just 
really drab and dreary back here. So same theme continues with that seat design. And then you've also got isofix points on the two outboard seats with three top tether points. This center section drops down and gives you access to two cup holders. So you can drop bottles in there if you need to. And then you've got storage for the bottle inside the door. So look, this is a pretty cramped space and it is a bit disappointing they didn't put a little more effort into the second row. But there is one upshot, watch this. The window goes all the way down. Let's sort cargo. So I've got some good news. In addition to saving money with the two-wheel drive, you also get more boot space. So the two-wheel drive gets 390 litres of cargo space. The all-wheel drive with its uh, hybrid motor at the back here robs you of boot space, which is good news. It's also a dual-tiered floor, which means you can have it up here or you can drop that tier out of the way and then you get yourself a little bit more storage space. Beneath both of these is a space saver spare tire. I'll show you what it looks like with our bags in there. Pop one in there, and we'll try this one over here. Yeah, look, I'm sure you could close the boot if you sort of wedge that in, or alternatively, you can go in sideways and then you have plenty of storage space there. And it's nice and deep as well, which means you can actually get a whole stack of things in there if you need to. And if you need a little bit more space, what you can do is get rid of this cargo blind. So I'll pop that out of the way. And then once that's out of the way, you can drop your second row. Oh, that's good. You can't drop your second row. Well, you can drop your second row, but you need to move the front seats forward. A little bit annoying given uh, that should just drop on its own. But anyway, once you do that, you have a little bit more storage space. Okay, we're on the road in the Yaris Cross. Let's start off with the engine and uh, the combination with the electric motor because this is, of course, a hybrid two-wheel drive version. So powering this is a one and a half litre, three-cylinder petrol engine. It's naturally aspirated. The petrol itself produces 67 kilowatts of power and 120 newton metres of torque. So it's barely anything, but it is supplemented by an electric motor on the front axle, and that provides a combined power output of 85 kilowatts. Toyota doesn't quote a combined torque figure because it varies throughout the torque band so uh, it will sort of team up with the petrol engine when it needs to and then other times like right now when the little EV light is on just there it is running just on electricity alone it's not until I get stuck into the throttle that it actually kicks on the internal combustion engine uses a CVT, so a continuously variable transmission, but it's not a conventional one. It has a mechanical first gear, so when it does take off, it's actually using an actual gear before it kicks into its standard CVT mode, where it does have 10 individual gears you can pick from as well. So what does all that feel like behind the wheel? Look, it's not, it's not the snappiest thing in the world, but it's also not the worst. It kind of just gets up and moves when it needs to. It doesn't really sort of pin you back in the seat, but it's adequate for where this car will be driving, which is probably in and around the city. Doing overtaking and that kind of stuff, you really want to be concentrating on what you're doing and getting stuck into the throttle nice and early. You do get a nice supplement of torque from the uh, electric motor, but you know, you're not really getting a huge amount to work with there. Now I'm going to switch that annoying lane departure stuff off because uh, it will just end up beeping at us the entire time. Toyota claims a combined fuel economy figure of just 3.8 litres per 100 k's. Let's have a look at what we're sitting on. 4.3, we're like pretty much bang on that number. That is such a small amount of fuel. It is genuinely remarkable. Now what about your drive modes? So you have Eco, which seems to make sense for a car like this. You have Normal and then you have Power. When you put it in Power, everything just becomes a lot snappier and it's ready to respond. Really all power mode's doing is bringing in a higher throttle position earlier in the pedal to make it feel like it's going faster. It isn't actually giving you any extra power or torque when it comes to hitting down the throttle. Just another couple of things I wanted to point out in terms of driving. You can slot this down into B mode and that increases the amount of, um, I guess, resistance you get as the vehicle slows down. It kind of gives you a little bit more charge into the batteries, but it feels like it actually uses a bit of uh, reduction gearing with the engine as well to slow the car down. So it's a really good system if you're going down long hills and you want to conserve a little bit of energy. And you can see how that whole process is going using that little screen there. So right now it shows you that we're using battery power to uh, run the vehicle, but if I push a little harder, it kicks in the internal combustion engine. Then when I roll out of the throttle, it all starts plumbing back into the battery pack. So yeah, really nice setup. And to be honest, I think this is exactly what people want from a car like this. It needs to be simple and for the most part, it is incredibly simple to operate all of these hybrid controls. Now, Toyota doesn't have an official 0 to 100 time for the Yaris Cross Hybrid, but we've put it up against our stopwatch and this is how it went.
Yeah, what's it like through corners? We've got a little corner coming up here. We're already in power mode. Let's give it a shot. Look, it's okay. It's it's not going to change the world, um, but equally, it's it's kind of fun at the same time. Now, you will have noticed that my talking has picked up a little bit. As we get to these ruttier sections of country road, there is a lot of tyre noise coming into the cabin. It is one of the downsides when they take something like a Yaris, which is very much a, I guess, uh, affordably built city car and then make it into an SUV. They don't seem to be adding any more insulation. And as a result of that, really communicates a lot of that through to the cabin. Now, what about the ride? So I mentioned in the intro that Toyota has this thing on the TNGA platform. TNGA in general is really good and the ride here is excellent. So even on a choppy country road, it's nice and smooth and very soft. And that's also partly thanks to the amount of profile you have on those tires. It is worth pointing out though, disappointingly, that the two wheel drive models get a torsion bar for rear suspension, whereas your uh, all wheel drive models have a multi-link rear suspension setup. And that's probably gonna affect this mostly when you're, I guess, driving the sporty manner. Uh, it is also slightly less comfortable when it comes to the choppier roads because you are getting a lot of feedback from left to right when you do hit potholes. You get that acceleration moment as the torsion beam reacts. Um, so look, it, it's probably not something you're going to notice, but it is worth keeping in mind that if you do invest in the all wheel drive version, you are actually getting a far superior suspension set up at the rear. Now steering, so low speed, it's, it's interesting. It's an electrically assisted steering rack, but the feel isn't fantastic. It kind of feels quite numb. I don't expect it to be a supercar, but now, even at low speeds, it really just lacks that sort of feel you'd expect. In power mode, it does feel slightly heavier, but I don't know, it'd be nice just to have a little bit more steering feel out of your sport utility vehicle, given that's what it's called. And then the turning circle comes in at 10.6 metres, which is pint-sized, and it is excellent for getting in and around the city. It's super easy to manoeuvre and park thanks to that tight turning circle. Visibility, so being a smaller car, it is excellent. So I'm able to see clearly down the front of the car there. Wing mirrors are small, but kind of big enough to see down the side. You've got a blind spot monitor built into those. Visibility out the rear is pretty good as well. I can sort of clearly see there and it's a pretty decent envelope as well. So the Toyota Yaris Cross. Um, I was kind of hoping that it would get better the cheaper that it was and the lower it was down the price range, but it kind of, I don't know, it still doesn't really do it for me. I, I think that Toyota just dropped the ball with it. They really didn't put a great deal of effort into it. And with a brand new car on a brand new platform, why would you not just go that extra mile to make it just something interesting and cool? Um, the upshots though, it is incredibly efficient. And I think that if you don't really care about interior materials and space in the second row and all that sort of stuff, this is probably a really good option if you're doing a lot of city driving or even a lot of highway driving because it is a class leader when it comes to fuel economy. So that is probably something to keep in mind and it isn't that expensive at this end of the price range. So it takes a little bit of the sting out of the lack of materials and stuff inside the cabin. So let me know what your thoughts are in the comments section. Our last video got a stack of views and people seem to really like the car, but I don't know if they're just watching it because they're interested in it or they're watching it because they're buying it. So if you were one of the people that bought it, let me know why you bought it over some of the competitors and, and whether some of the stuff that I was talking about really doesn't affect you. So really keen for your feedback. If you did enjoy this video, please make sure you like it and share it with your mates. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon. But until next time, take it easy.